Warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Dewey. I'm the international sales manager for Soil Mats. Today, uh, we have two presenters, uh, Joseph Irwin Jr., the general manager for Soil Mats, and a longtime plow owner himself, and then Ryan Zook, our product manager at Soil Mats as well. Uh, the agenda is going to be going through a presentation with you, uh, a few uh, housekeeping items. Up, you'll, up uh, into the right-hand corner, you will see uh, three tabs. One is a poll. We'd really like to hear from you on a variety of different questions. So if you did uh, insert those and uh, submit those poll questions, that'd be great. Uh, additionally, there are there's a tab for questions. So send us over your questions. We'll make sure I'll follow those and make sure that they, those, those are answered. And then there's also a chat feature as well that you can um, start typing in. So throughout, we, you know, we're here to hear from you. And the reason we do these live is to get your answers to uh, questions answered right away. Um, other than that, I will turn it over to Ryan and we'll do a screen share of our presentation. We'll get ready to go. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, we'll get the uh, presentation pulled up here and uh, we'll get started. So like uh, Brian said, uh, you guys are here to listen to us talk about subsurface drainage. Um, a little background on Joe and I, myself. Um, I've been, I'm the product specialist for Soil Max. Uh, I've been messing with tile plows now for about 12 years. Started out in the precision ag world and then came over to Soil Max in 2015. And I've been around the products, setting them up and using them since about 2009. Uh, I'll let Joe kind of introduce himself a little bit better. <laughs> I thought you were going to do that. So I'm Joe Irwin Jr. <clears throat> I'm the general manager at Soil Max. I've been here since uh, 2012. Uh, my dad and I bought our first plow back in 97, which was the first year of Soil Max. Um, uh, I'm a fourth generation farmer on our farm and uh, just got a passion for uh, for drainage and improving our ground. And, and uh, it was a real, real good opportunity when I got a chance to come and actually work for the company that you know, for 15 years, I've been using the equipment and, uh, and and really getting a lot of uh, benefit out of it. So that's a little bit about me. Thanks, Joe. Um, one of the first things we wanted to talk about in case you guys weren't familiar exactly what kind of what we do um, in this picture here, it kind of gives a good example of about everything um, involved in the drainage process if you were to purchase a, a Soil Max product. So you can see we've got some crop growing, we've got our soil, we've got water in the soil. Um, what our products are gonna do is allow you to efficiently and, and easily install drainage pipe to convey that extra water out of the field. Now we can do that if you have a ditch that's deep enough, we can do that through simple gravity. Or if you don't have a ditch that's deep enough, you can see in this picture where it says control and release, we can put pipe in into a, a well in the ground and then pump it out of that well into a waterway to get rid of that excess moisture in the soil. And one of the big things to remember about drainage, subsurface drainage, is we're not actually removing all of the moisture from the soil. The only moisture that's going to get carried out through the pipes is excess moisture that is actually harmful to your plants because the plants need the air pockets in the soil as much as they need moisture in the soil. And so what we're doing is removing all the excess moisture that the soil can't naturally hold on to anyway, and just taking it out of the field to create that air space in the soil that the roots need. Um, we have here our top 10 reasons to tile. This is kind of generic um, for all parts of the world and multiple crops. Um, the number one that we always get um, when we talk to people is the higher yields. So we're gonna be able to maintain higher yields through proper drainage by getting that excess moisture out of the soil that, that hurts your plants. Um, a lot of the studies in the US have, sh have, have been done to kind of see how much that factor is and on average across the main crops in the US, the, the wheat, 
the barley, the corn, the soybeans, that number tends to be about 30% increase in yields year to year on a drained field versus a non-drained field. Um, see, we have a question here. Oh. Um, yeah. So we, we have a question that says, what kind of problems have you been seeing on your farm this year regarding excess water? Is that for me? <clears throat> I would assume so because I don't have a farm. So. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in my in my particular location, uh, we've had oh I think we have twenty inches of rain, twenty three inches of rain in some of our fields since we've planted, uh, which is a, a lot for us. Um, and and I can say without a hesitation, everywhere I have tile, uh, we've handled that okay. Everywhere we don't have tile, we've struggled. And we don't have tile on every acre. Uh, we don't own all of our ground. We rent some of our ground. So the landlords uh, are hesitant, uh, don't want to spend the money, whatever the situation. Uh, but we see a huge difference there. I mean, we, we had replanting of, uh, on non-tiled ground this year, we probably replanted at least half of it. Um, so we're looking at a later planting date now. We're looking at uh, poor stands. We're looking at uh, oxygen deprived plants that just look lousy. Um, we're a few weeks from harvest. Um, it's not hard to imagine that I've got some non-tiled fields that will yield uh, in the neighborhood of half to 60% of what their tiled fields near them will be. Now I say that uh, in all all seriousness, that's that's very true. That's not the case every year. Um, I think it was last year uh, uh, on the corn, especially. We only saw about a 20, 25 percent increase in yield last year, but it was a lot uh, more. Uh, I guess the rains were were spaced more evenly last year. We didn't have a lot of ac excess water, uh, but. My my ground typically is very clay, high content of clay. If I get a lot of rain at once or when the plants are small, we, we've got big problems. So, yeah, we're seeing a lot of problems this particular year. Now, north of us in the U.S., <clears throat> northern Corn Belt, total opposite. They're in a drought. So, and, and that actually brings up a point we don't necessarily have mentioned here in this top 10 reasons to tile. Um but we've, we've had enough plows out there for a long enough time that we've we've talked to enough people and there's actually been some university studies done that that will show you real world data where having pipe in the ground actually helps you in a drought year and in some cases it actually helps you by a higher percentage than it does in a wet year and the reason for that kind of goes into the number three reason here um, are healthier roots so if we can have that pipe in the ground and we can get our water table down to a manageable depth and keep it there year round, when we plant those crops in the spring, on the non-tiled ground, our water table may be a lot higher. Well, what happens to our roots is they're only going to grow down to where they have oxygen. So once they hit that water table, they're not going to go much deeper. And so if we can get that water table down farther in the soil profile, we can get those roots to go deeper. And then in a drought year, we have deeper roots so that have a more profile to draw nutrients and moisture from. Sure. Now, one thing Ryan and I want to be clear on, it's not magic. So if you start out the year in a drought uh, and, the, and the, the water table is already below the tile, it's, the tile is not going to do anything for you. Right, Ryan? I mean, that, that, Correct. That's, that's not it. When it helps the most, and I, I think we've got some slides actually, Ryan, later on, uh, in 2012, nine years ago, we had a little bit of, of a wet spell in May, which is when we generally plant corn or we plant in April and May. A little bit of a wet spell, not much. And then no rain until late August. Horrible drought. One, the, the worst drought of my lifetime. Um, and and all of our tiled ground yielded 
Uh, I think that year was only 18% better, but I mean, the, the yields were horrible to start with. But, and what it was that, that one week or so there where the roots weren't struggling to get water um, on the untiled ground, where the tiled ground had, um, uh, the roots had gone deeper. So then by the time the drought started hitting at the end of May, uh, they were already deep and, and getting more water. Uh, we'll show some slides about that later. But yeah, for, for it to help in a drought, it had to be moist in the spring first. Uh, some of the, what they're experiencing out west, I think right now, Ryan, they were dry in the fall or fall in the winter. Yeah, a lot of the places were. Yeah. And, and so then, yeah, it's not magic. You know, we're not going to be able to to uh, uh, to just magically get water back in the soil. But the point is, if it was a little wet during planting and then it turns off really dry, which is a very typical scenario for my where I live. Yeah, this is when it just pays off at a, at a huge margin. Yep. <clears throat> Um, I was talking with Brian and uh, just talking with some of the growers in, in the UK, like you, like you guys, um, one of the other benefits is number two listed here, the longer growing seasons. So kind of going back to what we've just talked about, if we can, if we can get that water table down where it should be early in the spring through drainage, we can allow that field to warm up quicker we can get the excess moisture off of there and we can get, we can get in the field earlier than we typically would. Um, most of the time on a drain versus non-drain field, that might be up to three weeks quicker that you can get in the field to get the crop planted. And then the same thing in the, in the fall, we can keep that, if we keep that water table managed, we can stay out there longer before we start hurting the soil by compacting it with the combines and sinking in the mud and things like that. Um, and it all comes down to just getting that excess moisture out of the soil profile as quickly as possible. And like I said, we're not taking all the moisture out, just the excess moisture that's actually harmful to your plant. Um, now by getting rid of the excess moisture, we can, we can get into number four and number five. We'll have a, a better soil structure. We're going to have the air in there. We're going to get the earthworms. We're going to get the microorganisms in there. Um, that are just helping create and maintain a healthy soil on the fields. And by getting rid of the excess moisture, we can help reduce erosion. And we can do that by, since we don't have the excess moisture in there, every time you get a rainfall event, more of that moisture can soak into the soil before it has to start running off. And when you have soil running off the surface, it's taking stuff with it, whether that's soil particles, nutrients, um, fertilizers, anything like that. Um, we can help reduce that by letting more water actually infiltrate the soil. And um, then we also have a lower break-even price over here, number eight. What we're getting at there is actually the guy that started the company, he would challenge people that the first year they had that they were going to put pipe in, he would challenge them to take their the money they would have put into fertilizer and put it into pipe and probably gain the same benefits. Now, we're not going to go out and tell you to do that just because it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But what he was what he was getting at was with the same amount of inputs that you would normally put in, by getting your drainage under control, you're going to get a higher yield. Nine years out of ten. And so without changing your farming operation, as far as your inputs and, and seed and chemicals, you're gonna make more money. And so you can get by with a, with a lower commodity price at the end of the year because you put the same in, but you're getting more out. Um, and then all this leads to another thing here, the, the higher land value. By having proper drainage on your, on your soil, your ground becomes worth more because it can it can yield more, um, less disease pressure. Um, it, it's just an all around benefit. And then the number ten reason there is improved uh, weed control, and what we're saying there is by getting your drainage under control, you'll have healthier crops that can grow faster and bigger to be able to withstand weed pressure and resist weed pressure, mm -hmm. canopy faster to just kind of keep the weeds and diseases out. 
Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to this, Joe? No, I think that's a good list. I think that we've we've talked around that list for a long time, and that's yeah. th those are the benefits of tile. I mean, there's there's a bunch of them. Yep. Um, and just so you guys know, um, all this stuff, you will get a link after the presentation uh, that you can rewatch this video, pause it, see whatever, take notes on whatever you wanted to. So. Um, but if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them in the questions tab or the chat tab, and we'll try to do our best to answer them. Actually, we got one right now. Um, so, hi, Ryan and Joe. Are there soil, tape, soil types that do not suit drainage, i.e. heavy clays? Um, I'll go ahead and take this one if you don't mind, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of the things we uh, did recently as, as a company was we were involved in a a university drainage study that just got installed for Mississippi State. The soil type there was a very, very, very heavy clay. They call it sharky clay. The, I forget, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, the permeability rate was almost zero. And the whole reason for the study was to see if subsurface drainage would work in these conditions. So the, Backstory, we we went out and we already had a tile plan uh, from, a, from a professional company, designed it for the university. We went down there in May and started our installation process. We got our mains put in, uh, we got all our sub mains in, we got our water control structures put in, and we got half of the field, half of the research field, drained with the plots they were going to do drainage on. Then we got rained out. They got four or five inches of rain on this heavy clay, and we had to just pack up and come home for a little bit. Um, I think it was five weeks later, we went back down there to finish the job, and everywhere that we had put drain pipe in, you could walk across it. And it, it was, you didn't sink in. Everywhere that we hadn't put drainage pipe in on the other on the studies that weren't getting drainage and on the other side that just they had the sub mains, but no drainage. Um, the first day they were down there, they couldn't hardly walk across it because it was still so wet on top. Um, and it, it was very hard to get the pipe pulled in after that compared to before. And the difference between them was literally less than 100 meters apart but the one side had drainage on it the other side didn't and it was that much of a difference on some of the tightest clay i've i've ever been around so, <clears throat> so hopefully that answers that question and we'll continue so this here is a yield map um, taken from a field um, that we that we have some data for and you can see here this is our before You'll notice on the map, the, the red streaks, those are our lower yields in our red areas. So kind of keep that in mind as we go to this next slide. And you can see the difference here. So this, the field, the part in question here is about 66, 66 hectares. And I'll kind of go back and forth a little bit, but you can see the yield here is it's more uniform and, and not nearly as much red. Um, so here's before, here's after. This, in this particular instance, the difference was drainage. Uh, drainage was installed on this field and it took the wet spots out and increased the whole field by about 27% on yield. And one of the big benefits of drainage as well is not necessarily the yield increases, but also the uniformity of the yield. And so instead of having those highs and lows throughout the field, it's it's mostly all highs everywhere. And so we can get a better kind of cash flow estimate on what we're going to get off of it by getting that water management under control, getting the drainage under control. We can get a more consistent <clears throat> yield across the field and also consist more consistent from year to year. Yeah, and the other great thing here, Ryan, if you notice we flip back and forth a little bit. Um, you know, th this map here is, it's showing you a lot of problems and, and you got to try to figure out 
what what can I do to make it better? And and it's almost overwhelming. It's just either bright green or dark red, and and you you know uh, what what problems could be going on. Now we go to this one, and now when you see that the bulk of that field is green, now all of a sudden you've got the chance. Oh, I see on my turn rows every other turn, I've got a problem. Okay, so what is that? Is that compaction? Is it uh, is it where the planter's not turning on quick enough? Is it turned off too late and doubling up the crops so that they're overpopulated? Or is it compaction, like probably is on the vertical parts of those end rows? Also, <clears throat> it lets you start to micromanage that field, start to look at those orange and, and blue areas out there. They are there for a reason. Maybe it's, maybe it's a legit reason a little windstorm came down, knocked the corn down, and, and you get it. That's not going to happen next year. But when you start seeing that year after year after year, now we can know, well, let's go out there and do some really intensive soil sampling, see what's going on in those spots. It's amazing what you can do after a few years of, and then start to get this, this map to be totally green. Um, I know when we started tiling, my dad was one of the first yield monitor users uh, in our area, and he loved the yield monitor, loved to watch the yield monitor. And then the more we started tiling, I remember him telling me one day, he goes, it's not even fun watching the yield monitor anymore because the numbers don't change. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's okay, dad. <laughs> it's okay the numbers aren't changing because they're they're better. And he got it. He, he knew exactly. He was making a kind of a joke, I guess. But, you know, he, he his point was made clear, you know, the it, it really uniforms everything out. And then we can start picking apart the endros and the, and the other areas that might need some specific help so sorry to jump in there ryan but. oh no problem <clears throat> um so yeah i think that kind of explains these slides pretty well um and like i said like we've mentioned a couple times you can still kind of see between the two you can see where that that low spot is where we, we have a water issue um now that might need to become a surface ditch down the road um when you're just looking at it as a normal yield map, but then we go into the tiled part and we see that by, by getting our drainage under control there, yeah, it's still a little wet where that was, but we've managed to take care of a lot of that. And we're doing that once again, by just getting that water table down to a manageable depth. Um, some examples, some ROI, uh, this was, these numbers are, um, Oh, probably four or five months old. So the, the the pricing on pipe will be a little bit different depending on where you're at for the, the ROI examples. Um, but here we've got, if we were going to do 130 millimeter pipe, and one thing I want you to keep in mind um, as, as a company for soil max, um, when we specify a, a boot size where the tile goes through, we're specifying based off of the outer diameter of the pipe. So here in the U.S., we would have, say, a four-inch boot. On our European plows, we're going to call that our 130-millimeter boot because that's the outside diameter of that pipe. Um, and the reason why is just a lot of the other countries that we deal with, it, well, every other country is on the metric system, but um, all those countries, they, they want to go off the outside of the pipe just because it's easier to know that they look at that they measure this boot it measures 130 millimeters they know it's for their 130 millimeter pipe <clears throat> um so on a nine meter spacing with 130 millimeter pipe with the current prices on uh, on crops and when estimating that we get a 20 percent yield bump we're looking at about a seven year roi on our investment on pipe now, if we take that same pipe out to 12 meter spacing, same conditions, same yield bump, we knock off a year. So three meters wider on our spacing, and that's that could be doable depending on the soil types. Um, adding that extra three meters knocks a year off of our return on investment. And then same thing if we go down to the six mil or the 105 millimeter pipe, it's a six year, about a six year ROI even back down to that nine meter spacing, because by going to that smaller pipe, we're saving a little bit of money on the plastic itself. And then if we take that 105 millimeter pipe out to 12 meters, again, we'd knock a whole nother year off. So 
our cost of our cost of installation, which is our pipe, our fittings, those type of things. We can have that if we're in this example, we can have that completely paid back just on yield bump alone in about five years. Now there's other factors that come into that um, more than just the yield bump. Um, so some of those are the price of pipe, the price of the crops, the actual yield boost we get. And even more than that, we, we talk about a 20% yield bump, but I do a lot of field demonstrations um, all over the US and actually uh, we did one in Norway a few years ago. The biggest thing I, I hear from people that come to these that already have a plow or have had drainage installed is, we'll talk about this percent yield bump. And we say, we, we, I asked, does that seem fair on average? And a lot of guys, everybody will say, yeah, but they'll say, you know what though? It's, it's actually more than that when you get started because you're gonna start in your worst spots. And if you take a spot that is yielding zero and take it up to an average yield. So in our, if I just use uh, corn, for example, if we take a spot that's been consistently drowned out, um, they were never, never able to get corn planted on it. They had to plant soybeans in July. Um, I mean, that's essentially a, a, a zero yield. And if we take that to 150 bushels even, which is even, that's far below the average yield for where we're at on drain ground, we take it from zero to 150 bushels, even in the past years when corn was selling for $3 US, I mean, that's, that's quite a bit of difference that it makes, so. We talk about the average, like, but starting out, it's probably going to be more than that because you're going to be catching the worst parts of your farms. Anything you want to add to that, Joe? No, I mean, you, you summed it up very well. We've, <clears throat> so my dad and I, when we first bought our plow, we had a conversation about, do we go just drain the wet spots? Or do we do what's what's called a system tile, where we just put tile, you know, every nine meters or, or whatever? Um, and we had a lot of discussions about that. In the end, we finally decided we were just going to put it in on a system, on a grid, where it's just we ignored where the wet spots were, just just tiled it uh, in a pattern. And um, our neighbor that bought the plow with us, he he had some farms where he just did wet spots that first year. And it, he only did that for a year because we, we quickly found out where we thought our wet spots were. Obviously, they were wet, but the, the whole field was wet. And, and what we would do is, is he would go dry one spot up. Then the whole field, you know, that one spot dries up, the whole field's wet. And he still didn't gain much. So my dad and I are great believers in just putting it in on a pattern, catching everything at once. And then the whole field farms at the same time every year, very consistent crops. Um, even we had one field that we, we rent from a, from a lady and it's 43, 44 acres to us. And about 10% of that in the middle would drown out every year. Oddly enough, we could almost always plant it, but then it just would, would drown out. It just couldn't drain. It was, so a, a, a swale, we call it, uh, that held the water. And we tiled the entire field uh, one fall. And the next year, the yield bump was so huge to her. Uh, it, was, it was far greater than 30%. And, and, the, and my dad and I were talking about it. The reason she thought the yield increase was so much was because to her, that's all she had was that 43 acres. Well, she was only getting income really off of about 38 of it every year, maybe 37 by the time that water spread out through the field. And, and we took that huge red area of zero in the middle that was four acres, 10% of the field, and got a, a full crop off of it. And my gosh, she was, she was just thrilled with the results that she got. And, uh, and the other thing, uh, you know, it keeps us in a good relationship with her on keeping to rent that farm, you know, as time goes on. So, yeah, the ROI is so good on tiling. It's, it's incredible. Just it, on my farm, 
the only thing I've ever done that came close to the return on investment on tile is we irrigated some sand ground that my dad has. Uh, that, that's the only thing we've ever done that came close to putting tile on the wet ground on return on investment. I'm a big believer in return on investment on tile. Just nothing compares. So, and actually that's, that's one of the reasons that the guy that started the company decided to start the company is before this, he was, uh, he was heavily involved in a company that did, that did yield mapping. They would take the yield data, they would take the GPS data, combine it, and would show showing yield. And through that, way back in the mid '90s, he was seeing that direct correlation to drain ground versus undrained ground on the yield maps. And he decided that he, it, it was enough, it was a big enough deal that he decided to sell the mapping company and start the drainage company. Um, just because it was that obvious once you start looking at things, especially back in the mid nineties where, where it wasn't as easy for people to install their own pipe. So, um, and through him starting this company, he's, we've made it so anyone can do it with the plows because they they can go behind pretty much any tractor out there. And then the control system is it's, it's foolproof. It's, it's easy. Um, and it's, it's just, it's too simple to not do it. So, so with that, we'll kind of get over into the, the product side of things and I'll let Joe go ahead and take over here. Sure. So this is, uh, was there another question? Uh, nope, that was an air poll. Oh, okay. So yeah, this is my portion of the presentation of uh, introducing the equipment that SoilMax makes. So up to this point, you've been listening to uh, Ryan and a little bit of me talking about the advantages of tile. The, the webinar is going to change focus just a little bit. We're going to talk about the equipment that we manufacture for you that, that'll, that'll move to your farm on your tractors and, and install this tile. So we, we make three different models of tile plows. Uh, and I like this photo. Uh, it shows all three of our plows. And when you start at the left and work to the right, um, so we have what we call a ZD48. In Europe, it's a ZD1200. Basically, the, the plow on the left will go 1.2 meters deep. Um, it'll, it'll do the smaller sizes of tile. Um, so it'll do, what, 130 millimeter on down, Ryan? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so the, we have an 80, 105, and 130 millimeter yeah. boots for that one. Um Ryan's way better on metric conversions than this than I am. So that, that's why I'll throw that out there. I'll start throwing inches at you. So it, it's a smaller plow made for smaller tractors. Uh, the middle plow is, is basically the same plow. It just goes 1.6 meters deep uh, all the way up to, what, 190 millimeter tile, something yep. like that. Yep. And then uh, the, the plow on the back is what we call our pull-type plow. Hooks to the tractor, completely different. Uh, and it'll go uh, six and a half foot deep, which is another foot on top of 1.6 meters. Um, so almost almost two meters, I guess. Anyway, what I want to talk about in this photo is the plows we manufacture, they, they achieve and maintain their depth or their grade, all of them the same way. doesn't matter which plow you buy from Solmax. It, it goes in the ground and stays on grade the exact same way as the other two plows that you didn't buy. Um, the way we do this is those cylinders on top, uh, the two larger plows have got two cylinders, the smaller plows got one cylinder. It changes the angle of that shank in the ground. Now there's a couple of pictures later that might make that clearer, but we're gonna stay on this picture right now. And what it does, it, if you need to go down in the profile, it, the, the oil comes out of the cylinders, the front end of the shank tips down and it digs deeper. It just, it pulls itself down. If you need to come up in the soil profile, the opposite happens. Put some oil in the cylinders, tilt that shank up, similar to flying through the air, um, although it pulls a lot harder. This is how we get through the ground is by tilting that shank up and down and it'll, it'll drift through that soil profile. And all three plows do that exactly alike. That's the beauty of Solmax. All of our equipment performs the same way. 
it allows us to have a real conversation with you or our dealer have a conversation with you about which is the right plow for your farm because we don't care. We want you to get the correct plow for your tractors and your and your ground. And we have confidence whichever one you buy is going to work correctly because they're all designed the same way. Now, a lot of people will come up to me at a show or, or even in a webinar and they'll say, well, isn't it better to have the wheels on the plow? That, that's the typical thing they, they ask. Um, because people see the pull type plow, the plow on the right there, and they think, oh, those wheels have got to help somewhat maintain grade. And in fact, it makes no difference. Those wheels, once you're tiling, once you get it in the soil profile, there's a switch in the cab and those wheels go into float. And all they're doing is keeping that plow from going side to side or tipping. But the depth is absolutely not affected by the wheels. They're taken out of the equation. The IntelliSlope doesn't look at them. They're just floating on the ground, keeping it from tipping over side to side. Similarly, similarly on the three-point plows, you put your three-point hitch in float while you're tiling. So that three-point hitch is not providing any lift or, or, or keeping the plow from going too deep. It's floating. It's only pulling the plow forward. And so when people ask which plow is better, it, it's, it's just exciting me because I can sit there and say, well, let me ask you some questions. You know, what size tractors do you have? How deep do you need to install your tile? We can ask all those questions of the, of the farmer and then pick the correct plow to fit on their farm. It, it, only, it only improves the return on investment if you buy the correct plow for your farm, whichever one it is. That's what I like about this slide. It, it shows all three of them work exactly alike. Uh, they just hook to the tractor different and really just go to different depths. So anything to add to that, Ryan? No, other than going back to your wheel comment, um, I do a lot of the product testing for the company and we've proved this. We can go out in the field and we can chain those tires up once it's in the ground so they're not even touching and the ability for it to stay on grade is not affected at all. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful design, beautiful design. In fact, I'll go so far as to say you don't want to try to control grade with something that's above the ground. Um, you know, your topo can change. There could be a ditch. There could be uh, a rise in the ground that could affect the grade down below. And this design of plow totally eliminates the wheels on the tractor or the wheels on the plow, for that matter, from affecting the grade down below. It's just beautiful design. So... Our plows are called, they usually have ZD in their name somewhere. That stands for zero deflection. The plow on the left in this picture is, is a model of our old plow. And actually, it's a model of all the competitors that we face. Um, that's, how, that's what our plow used to look like. Our current plow is this yellow plow that, on the right. And if you'll notice, the big difference between the two is where the tile exits in relationship to the pivot point of the shank. And what, what we found, oh gosh, I guess over 10 years ago now, that as you're making a grade change, the further behind the plow that the tile exits, excuse me, the more chance you have of having pressure or a pinch point in that tile, which can reduce the flow. So we redesigned the plow, we moved everything forward, and we've we've got the exit point of that tile directly underneath the pivot point. So now even if we make a big grade correction up or down, the, the, the tile doesn't raise up or down at the back of the boot because it's, it's at the very bottom of that pivot point, which is actually just like a, a pendulum or a, or a radius in a circle. It's not going to move up and down. It's just going to move side to side and not pinch the tile. Even better design than the old one. And it, th this is what has set us apart uh, selling plows is that zero deflection technology uh, allowing us to install tile and then not have any pinch points whatsoever. Uh, so next slide, same plow. And th the other big point about buying a plow is if you buy a tile plow, you want to be able to use it. 
And if you if you buy a plow and you can't pull it, it didn't do you any good. And so what we found, we've always had people tell us that this new design pulled easier. And what we found is Ryan did a lot of testing. And, and I'm actually going to let Ryan talk about this, if this is OK, Ryan, about the, the pull testing you did and and where the plows start pulling hard uh, in your in your experience and when you tested the competitors plows. Yeah. So um, what we did is we actually took a draw, took the draw bar off of one of Joe's tractors and built our own where we put a, a load cell in it. And we could, by putting our load cell in the draw bar, we could measure the pull force that each plow was requiring. And we set up a study where we did each plow, we would do a certain size boot and we would do a certain depth. And we did it multiple, multiple passes across the field. Um, varied everything up try to keep it as random as or keep the study as random as possible for soil types and things like that but um yeah well what, what we found is pretty much wherever that angle um if you look at the plow on the left um where that angle stops coming up on the bottom of the plow when you hit that your plow starts to pull exponentially harder and the reason for that is up to that point, you're lifting the soil, you're fracturing the soil all the way up to the surface. And so you're kind of opening up, it's, it's kind of like a cartoon. You're kind of opening up the soil and sliding right through there like a like Bugs Bunny or something would do. Um, with, But once you get past that point where it's lifting all the way to the surface, you're lifting, but you're still, you're fighting everything on the surface and that everything above that still has to physically drag through the soil. And on different designs, you might be able to get a little bit deeper before it starts to pull so much harder. Um, but what, with the, with the stealth ZD technology, the ZD of course means zero deflection. The stealth is just how easy it pulls. And the reason for that is that lifting action doesn't stop at the top of that black triangle on the on the plow on the right the lifting action doesn't stop until you get all the way up to that pivot point because of the angle of the shank and the wings that are at the back of that shank it, it just continues to lift all the way through the profile and, and pulls once we get down to say that five foot or that 1600 millimeter depth or that two meter depth uh, with the big with the pull type plow, I mean it's it's in the it was like fifty percent easier than the closest competitor to pull at that depth just because we we continued to lift the soil and fracture the soil all the way to the surface. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. That's <clears throat> the big difference is we want to make sure you can pull the plow, and uh, the the old what we used to say with the old design of plow was. Well, the ground was already fractured up there at the top because of the fracturing at the bottom and it didn't really make any difference but we really found out that wasn't true if you keep that fracturing going on all the way to the top it's a significant difference um, and the plows that pulled the hardest had the smallest amount of lift um, just across the board so yeah we want to make sure that when you buy a plow from us you're going to be able to pull it so that that's important so the features that you didn't even know you needed about our plow, we're going to go to go through this quick. Um, but when you go to change tile size, you need to change the boot. And that's everything that's black in that left uh, small left picture there. Everything that's black needs changed anytime you change tile size. It's very important to always have the correct size boot for the tile. I've got some pictures a little bit later to show you why. But for this picture, for this conversation, what you need to know, it's quick to do it. It's easy. It takes two bolts, two wrenches, and the pieces come right off, go right back on, lock together with the two bolts, and you're going again. Not a problem. The second feature that uh, we want to feature today is the power feeder. It is an option. Some people don't feel they need a power feeder. However, a power feeder is uh, going to eliminate stretch in the plastic pipe. And the number one uh, killer of pipe over time is stretch. Uh, you don't want that pipe stretched when it goes into the ground. Now, I'm going to show you a picture here in a couple 
a couple more pictures of, of another thing we do to reduce stretch. But this is step one. We get that tile pulled up, get it right over the boot, and let it basically drop in so there's no stretch whatsoever. And you do that with a power feeder. Any of our plows can have a power feeder attached to it. No problems. If you buy a pull type, if they decide that's the plow that's right for you, we do sell a walking tandem kit for it. It smooths right out when, you, when you're driving around with it. It also widens the stance of the plow when you back up over the start hole, which is very helpful at times. So uh, that's, that's an option. Uh, the fourth thing that you didn't even know you needed is, is free, and it comes with the plow. It's as narrow as it can be. We've got slick uh, poly bolted to the sides of all the wear parts of the plow uh, where we can use poly. And yeah, it, it's just slick. We make it go through the ground. When it pulls up out of the ground, there's not a lot of mud stuck to it. Very important so that it's pulling easy through the ground. And then that final feature is our, our boots, the, the part that the tile falls into are square. And the reason they're square is so that there's the fewest amount of points of that steel and inside there's even poly inside that, that curved part. We want to have as few pieces touching the tile as possible. And to do that, you use a square section and put a circle through it. If you had a circle and you put a circle through it, you're much more liable to get uh, drag and stretch in that tile. And we just don't want to stretch the tile. So anyway, these are the features uh, uh, that you didn't even know you needed that we have. Uh, not a lot to talk about there. Anything you want to add, Ryan, or I'm going to move on? Uh, no, just the, the, the big thing is the, na the narrow width, uh, the, the size of our shank is about two and a quarter inches. That's uh, about 55 millimeters. The, the, reason, the way we can do that is the actual material we use. We build the plows out of T1 steel. And by laminating the shank, it gives us the strength, the, the same equivalent as having, say, a 200 millimeter shank. So. Yep. Okay. So real quick, uh, I've got a better picture of this. Yeah. So what's important is the, the, the bottom shape of our boots cradles that tile on three sides. Now, this picture is a little, little hard for me to follow, um, but a, one of our competitors uses a V-bottom, only supports the tile on two sides, um, leaves a pocket down below the tile where erosion can occur. We actually have a little bit of a flat bottom, and then we have the bottom of a hexagon, basically. We have three sides that are cradling that tile. Um, very important to cradle your tile properly, bed it properly, in the real world, this is what it looks like, the picture on the right. That's how that tile looks bedded uh, when you literally just do a cutaway in the soil. And you see it's, it's bedded underneath, keeping, and it's going to keep that tile round for its entire life. And that's very important. You don't want egg-shaped, oval-shaped tile. The, the most water you're ever going to get through that tile is in a circle. Anything besides that circle, the amount of water that can go through there is, is degraded. And so that's why it's important, excuse me, to bed that tile on the bottom, keep it perfectly round, keep the tile healthy so it lasts, you know, for generations, uh, draining that water off of your field. Ryan? Yeah, not only that, but keep it, all the fittings are, are made round as well. And so if you're if your fitting is round and your pipe's not bedded correctly and your pipe starts to deform, then you introduce differences in the, how the connection's made where it can get some gaps in it and it can start letting soil into it. It can start filling up the pipe with silt, sand, clay, whatever happens to get in there. And the, the more that happens, the quicker the, the lifespan of the pipe's going to be degraded. So the rounder we can keep it, the more soil tight are all of our fittings stay. But we did have a question. question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we did have another question here. He says, um, I noticed there is no gravel used. Why is that? Um, so there's a couple areas in the U.S. where people use gravel around their pipe. Um, it's If you're familiar with the country, it's pretty much dead center up around uh, Lake Erie. Um, 
in Northwest Ohio. Um, the the guys up there, the reason they're doing it is because the clay is so tight and they're putting their pipes so shallow, um, usually less than usually less than two feet. Um, that they they they're doing it for structural support around the pipe because when they drive over it without enough gravel around it they they feel like they they risk crushing the pipe itself just based off the weight of the equipment going over it um we do have an option for an aggregate boot um for the zd 1200 zd 1600 um it sells pretty well in europe the the re all these pictures are taken from the u.s and in the vast majority of the country most of the research that's been done shows that there really isn't much benefit as long as your pipe is installed correctly and by correctly we mean not stretching it at the right depth for your soil and at the right spacing for your soil um, there really isn't much need for the gravel or other aggregates but we, th that is an option that we have for both, like I said, the ZD1600 and the ZD1200 is an aggregate box that you can put in uh, gravel, pea gravel. Some people are doing wood chips, but um, with as you're installing the pipe. Yeah, it's a, so I, I guess my quick answer would be on the, on the gravel. We see it that it's a very regional specific request. Um, and that's why we developed the aggregate box. We sell it primarily in, in Europe uh, because of the demand. In, in the US, there's millions of miles of tile installed and no aggregate around it. So I'm not gonna sit here and preach that it's right or wrong. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, what, uh, it's what the regions demand. And it seems like that's a very regional specific uh, request. So we gladly provide an aggregate box, uh, just not need pictures. So. And I was, uh, I went, I attended the Overholt School of Drainage four years ago. Um, it's kind of known for the, um, in the U.S. as the drainage school for the theory behind it and things like that. Um, their philosophy, and, and they are based in Ohio where the, where they kind of do the gravel. Their philosophy on it was it's just kind of the way it was done in the past, because when you had a trencher installing pipe, you weren't necessarily digging a trench that, that was shaped to the pipe. So if you were putting in, say, 190 millimeter pipe, you might be trenching a 300 millimeter trench. And the best way to, ins to ensure that pipe had good support around it was to backfill with gravel then once plows came around and plows started cutting the shape of the trench that was needed you no longer needed the gravel to make sure that you had good support all the way around the pipe but some people that were in like i said in the u.s that were around it back in the trenching days they just kind of carried that on that they wanted gravel around their pipe just as a kind of as a just made them feel good mm -hmm. um, but most all the studies that I've seen that have been done and just like Joe said, the the millions and millions of miles of pipe that have been installed, not only with our plows, but every other plow in the U.S., very little of that actually gets gravel or an aggregate around the pipe or on top of the pipe. And a lot of it's been dug up to make connections or um, it's silted in or what whatever. They got a suck hole in it, um, had mouse dig chew holes in it, um, whatever the case was, um, the pipe was still, the, the pipe, it could tell they didn't, they were fine without needing the gravel around it. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, if there's a follow-up question that we welcome it, we're going to move on right now. I don't, don't see a follow-up yet. So, so part of the, the soil max, uh, way, you know, we're simple, uh, we need about 90 kilowatts uh, tractor to, to, to pull these plows. Um, it, it really depends on your soil type, really depends on your depth. Probably as important as, as weight uh, because the power, we just need a minimum of 90 kilowatt. What we need is weight and we need good tires. Uh, again, this is something your dealer can talk to you about, but in general, the, the taller, the more narrow the tire, the better. 
the heavier the tractor, the better. Um, aside from that, we don't care if it's three point pull type, anything like that. Just a nice simple connection, single set of hydraulic hoses, one cable goes to the Intel slope. That's it. So real simple. Um, and that benefits you in a lot of ways. We all know that the simpler the solution, the more likely we are as farmers or as just people to implement that solution. So we do make some accessories. One thing I want to add back there real quick, Joe, just like I said, from being in Norway there for a little bit, um, we do prefer a closed center hydraulic system on the tractor. Um, the reason for that is if, if you start to get in, if you start to pull hard on the plow, the best thing you can do is slow down. Um, and on a on an open center hydraulic system, your hydraulic flow is directly related to your engine RPMs, where a closed center system is not and so on a closed center system we can vary that engine speed to speed up or slow down to match the conditions without affecting how the plow the hydraulics the plow is getting and using that to maintain grade perfect yep so so we do make some uh, accessories we're going to breeze through these pretty quick to honor your time and see if there's any other questions but we do make uh, heavy duty carts that will unspool the tile uh, as well in, in the EU, um, if you have in, in uh, Great Britain or wherever we sell these, we do make a basket that I don't really have a picture of that will hold a smaller roll of tile directly on either of the three-point plows. And what um, what size would that hold, Ryan? Refresh my uh, I think it holds up to 100-meter rolls, and you could put two to three on there. Yeah. So... Uh, that's another option, but we've got different methods to unspool that tile to help you out. Again, that's a good dealer question to, to ask. Uh, the carts have got wireless remotes. Those are those are awesome. We make what's called a Shaper Pro to uh, to close the trench up behind. If you're going really deep, if you're going in uh, uh, really heavy clays, sometimes you get a big trench that needs worked back in. We make this uh, Shaper Pro to, to work all that back in, get the soil crumbled up, ground up right back over the tile trench, give it a, a winter or give it a few inches of rain. Uh, the trench is, is just going to fill right back in perfectly. Uh, another option for you. Hey, so Joe, real quick before we get into controls, um, the question was asked, is a power beyond preferred over a set of spools? Um we don't necessarily need the power beyond. Um, if that is your option, then then yes, we can handle that. The uh, the way the plow works is we're actually going to put your your hydraulic remotes into a constant flow, and then there's a valve on the plow that is opening and closing to send the oil whichever way it needs to on the on the machine. Um, so yeah, power beyond can be made to work because, like I said, all we're doing is putting a constant flow to the plow. A lot of guys would rather, or a lot of people would rather prefer to run it off of a spool just because it, that way they can, they can shut it on and off and they can adjust the flow um, to get it dialed into where they want it the first time they set it up. So, Yeah, excellent question. Really, really good questions there. Um, where was I going? Oh, well, I was going to turn it over to you for a little bit. You're the, okay. usually I have to do this, but folks, I'm going to tell you, if you want to hear about IntelliSlope, you need to hear it from Mr. Zook. He is the master with IntelliSlope. So I'm going to, I'm going to bow out and let him run through the IntelliSlope with you guys. Okay. Well, I'll try not to disappoint you here, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that build up, it's all you now. So, um, so yeah, IntelliSlope is the control system that we recommend for, for any tile plow, but especially ours. Um, the Teleslope was actually created back in, uh, this is the work started on it back in like 2008 and 2009, it became a product that the soil max released and the, the advantage of the Teleslope over some other control systems is in Teleslope is the only tile plow control system that was developed specifically for a tile plow. And it was also developed specifically for the soil max line of tile plows. Um, the requirements that uh, Denny Bell had when he was, when they were creating it was it had to hold grade and it had to be easy enough. An average farmer could pick it up and run with it. And 
he succeeded on both accounts. Yep. So it says here tiling and in, installing tile made easy and accurate. It it is honestly the easiest part of the whole tile or pipe installation process is the Intel slip side of things. Um, we're going to do two things. We're going to do a survey. And by survey, what I mean is we're going to drive where we want that pipe to go on the ground at one time with the plow up in the air. And it's measuring the surface of the soil where we're going to put that pipe. On the planning phase, we tell it a set of parameters and you can hard, you, there might be hard to see depending on your screen size, but the first one is a minimum slope. Next is a minimum depth, a maximum depth, and then a target depth. And so what IntelliSlope does is it goes and looks at that soil profile and it says, okay, I'm never going to be less slope than what you told me. I might be more, but I'll never be less slope than the minimum you said. And now, and then I'm going to stay between the minimum and maximum depth. And anywhere I can, I'm going to put my pipe at your target depth. As long as everything fits in there, you have a green check mark, you're ready to install. And the thing to remember is gravity works the same all over the planet. Water goes downhill. So you're going to, you want to make sure you have, you're starting at your low side and going uphill with the water. If, if that's the case, then more than likely you're going to have a green check mark. So um, the next step is install. And installing is as simple as setting the plow down in a start hole, whether that's for a main or making a connection into a main. You're going to lower the plow down in there. You're going to load the pipe in the plow. You're going to hit start install, and then you just start driving. If you have auto steer installed on your tractor, if you engage your auto steer, once you hit start and engage your auto steer and start moving, you're just along for the ride. The system does everything else for you as far as changing your depth, changing your grade, um, does all that on the fly. And since you've mapped the profile out ahead of time, it knows what's coming. And so it's it's anticipating changes that are coming up in the soil so it can adjust before it gets there to stay inside those minimum and maximums and above the minimum grade. Um, it, it's just, it's very simple to use. Um, an example I've started giving recently um, based off of last fall is my wife had never even been in a tractor in her entire life before last fall. And we were actually putting some pipe in the ground on one of Joe's farms. And I put her in his tractor, took about a half an hour to teach her how to drive it just to get used to the, cause it was an articulated tractor, teach her how to get used to that. Um, and then I rode with her and showed her the buttons on three runs of putting pipe in. And after that, I was not allowed back in the tractor um, because she said I was letting all the air conditioning out every time I opened the door. <laughs> so the, the system is that easy to run that someone that had never been in a tractor before that day was able to install pipe. And it will not let you do something that won't work. And it does everything for you. So it, it is the simplest part of the entire installation process. Um, think some of the things you can do if you don't already have a good topography map for your fields, you can, with IntelliSlope, you can go out and collect a topography for the field as long as you have your RTK signal activated. Um, it comes in really handy on some fields where it might look mostly flat, but you can do a topography and see where the low spot is or which side of the field the main should be on or which corner of the field the water is going to exit from to best use gravity to your advantage when you're draining the field. Um, one thing I mentioned RTK is the, the one thing that IntelliSlope does require is good RTK. So we don't care what RTK system you use as long as it's accurate. We have adapter cables for most major brands out there. And if it's not a major brand, we have a generic cable that can be made to work. Um, we just need to get reliable RTK signal into the system. Uh, looks like we had a chat here. It was a cost estimate. So I'm not sure you're gonna be able to flesh that out real quick. Oh, yeah, it's that's going to kind of be a question for the local pipe supplier, because um, even here in the United States, that's going to vary. Um, I know in our area of the United States, 
the cost of pipe itself is when it has almost doubled, but there's other parts of the country where it's tripled just depending on where exactly they're at and who the manufacturer of the pipe is. So, um, sorry, we can't answer that better. Cause like I said, it, it is very regional. So I think the big pipe supplier in the U S has actually seven different regions with different pricing right now. So, okay. With that, I'll turn it back over to Joe. Yeah. I think we're just kind of here for a wrap up now. I mean, uh, with soil max, you've got the complete tile system. We can take care of the of the actual plow, the most important aspect of all this. Uh, we can take care of the IntelliSlope system from AgLeader, get that supply, get it all set up for you, calibrated, ready to go. Uh, the cart, the Shaver Pro, the accessories, maybe they fit your farm, maybe you need something else, that's all fine. Uh, the primary components, of course, are the plow and the control system. And, uh, you know, you, you really want to pay attention get, we want you to talk to your dealer. We want you to figure out which of those three plows fits your needs. What, what fits your tractor, what fits your, your farm, um, unmatched tech support. So there's a little bit of a time differential between, uh, obviously great Britain and the U S but tech support comes back through to, uh, uh, through our home office here in, in, in Indiana, the United States. Uh, you can do that. You can talk to your dealer. We've also got email. Uh, you can you can text us. Most of your questions, quite bluntly, can be solved through email. Uh, maybe a quick phone call. Uh, we're more than willing on our tech side to meet your hours, whatever they are, uh, if we need to do a FaceTime, something like that. Uh, One of the big advantages of the Ag Leader product is with the with the in command 1200s and even their older display the integra um, they have an option in there that if you have internet available in the cab whether it's through a hotspot on your phone or just a, a way to get internet into your tractor cab we can actually remotely view your screen if you're having issues um, and and help you out that way as well uh, we can't make any changes but we can we can see your screens as we're talking to you on the phone and it, it, that way we can kind of see what looks right, what doesn't and, and get you up and running quicker that way as well. Absolutely. So the, the final thing is, and you guys can watch this again. Uh, you don't, you, you can write this down if you want to, but if you got questions, you can go to soilmax.com. There's an info button that'll come to me. I'll get it distributed to your dealer, to your, to your managed territory manager, or if, if it's something I can answer, I'll gladly answer it. Also, if you need to reach out to me directly, there's my email address, joseph.erwinjr.soulmax.com. Uh, we're more than happy to talk to you folks. We love the conversation. We we enjoy what we do. The team at Soulmax, great bunch of people. They enjoy what they're doing. They want to make sure you get the proper piece of equipment for your farm. And as you can see, we've got three different pieces that does the installation. So something we have will fit what you're doing in your farm. So with that, um, if you've got another question, hit that chat real quick or hit the questions real quick. If not, I think we're about ready to wrap it up, Brian. Excellent. Um, well, I appreciate all the farmers that were able to get on today. I know in the UK, you're currently, it's beautiful weather and you're currently in the midst of harvest. And that's where most of our people were um, were coming from. So I appreciate the ones that have have jumped on. Yep. Have a safe harvest. Uh, I mean, that's great. Have a safe harvest, and yeah, um, reach out to us if you have any questions. Obviously, you've been, if you've been talking to Kyle or Cody from Farm Export, um, continue that conversation with them, and let's make sure that uh, we can uh, get everything you know answered for you and we'll be doing some demos over uh, in the uk in the coming months and we'll keep you updated on that as well so so i want to say to john gray he picked the right one to start asking questions to so <laughs> you made a good move there john ask ryan <clears throat> um i appreciate everybody and uh yeah until next time yep thanks <laughs>